to uh, call the uh, September 26th school committee meeting to order. Uh, welcome everybody uh, tonight. Uh, the agenda is a little bit, a little bit out of order. Uh, we'll, we will always start with public input. After that, we'll have the uh, second portion of the uh, youth risk behavior survey. We'll have the superintendent's evaluation and then uh, reports at the end. So, uh, before, so before we start, is there anyone that has public input for something that's not on the agenda tonight? Seeing none, uh, and I'd like to do a consent agenda too. Yes, uh, move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Second. Yes. Dr. I'd Dr. like to pull the minutes for Sorry, I didn't get my uh, thing open yet. The minutes that are at the beginning of the packet, sorry. It's moved. September 12th. For September 12th? Yeah, please. There are reasons for that? Yes, and I would be, I have the wording. So in it, um, I really appreciate all the efforts to make the um, minutes succinct, and I know that it's not a transcript. I felt it was important to note that when Mr. Tompkins was talking about the buildings, that he made a point of saying that our facilities has done a great job, and that was in there, thank you. Um, he also said that all of our buildings are physically safe and sound, and I thought that was something that people really are looking to hear and need to hear, that we needed to hear. So I, um, what I'd like to add to those minutes is a statement. Um, Mr. Tompkins indicated that our facilities department has done a great job maintaining our school buildings, that's already in there, and adding all, and that all are physically safe and sound now. There is a good time, this is a good time for us to have planned the enrollment study because it can take three to five years to plan research and funding for a new building project. It's likely that we will need to be considering a new project in five to 10 years, so having done the study now will help us be prepared. Am I speaking loud enough, loudly? So I just wanted to suggest, and I'm fine with that being a friendly amendment, if that's comfortable. Anybody object? No, I guess the only question I have is mm -hmm. the word now, like they were ever not physically safe? No. I, that's not what was implied, so, right, so I'm fine with now, that. But otherwise, I'm okay with that. Personally. Thank you for that edit. And I have and you a can copy. Give that to Linda. Thank you. And the other in the same minutes. Um, it talks about Dr. Darty coming back, and I thought it was really important to note that he made a heartfelt thank you to the central staff um, who stepped up to run the district and commended their vital work running the district in his absence. And if I could find that piece of my packet, it got turned around. I have the wording for that. Can you get the gist of it? Does anyone? That. So that's what I would like to add, and then I'm comfortable with the minutes. I will. Can I give it to you at the end when I fish it out of my pile? Thank you. Okay. Is everyone ready to vote on the consent uh, agenda as amended? All those in favor? Five zero. Pull the minutes out so we can vote the minutes separately. Um, move to approve the minutes of September 12th, 2019, as amended. Second. All those in favor? Five zero. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> before we uh, start, I did want to, and we'll, it, this comes up later in the agenda, but I just did want to uh, take a moment to uh, publicly. Uh, thank Elaine Webb 
for her service, uh, 12 plus years of, of uh, you know, tireless uh, work on behalf of the children. So uh, I thank her for that and, and wish her well. If anyone else wanted to say anything. Okay, and that, that, will, that process will come up later in the agenda, how to appoint somebody. Okay, uh, Erica, we're ready for you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me back to continue our conversation on the Youth Risk Behavior Survey results. Tonight, I'm gonna be focusing on the middle school results. And um, we have a few people from our middle school um, buildings with us, including our SRO, Officer Matt Batcher. Um, he's newer to the, the role, but it's been amazing having him in that. Um, and he's been a resource for both middle schools. Um, so as we talk about some of the safety stuff, I think it's also important to know we have that added resource this year um, that we haven't had in previous years. So. Um, we did the introductory to what the survey is, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on what the survey is because we did that last time, but I did want to include it in the packet in case people were viewing it for the first time. But again, this is a survey we do every two years. We work with an outside provider. This time um, it was John Snow, Inc., JSI, um, and the study was funded by Leahy Health for the Middlesex League districts with the exception of Lexington, who chose not to participate. Um, why we study risk behavior is really to focus on how we can understand what is happening with our young people and also to better predict and plan for um, not just curriculum, but how we can build a stronger community looking at social and emotional learning and a lot of the other important themes in our district. Um, anytime we're talking about risk behaviors, I do think it's important to maintain focus also on the other side of the coin, which is those protective factors that all of us are trying to build with our young people, whether you're doing it as a parent, as a coach, as a teacher, as a para, um, as a librarian, that work with young people, focusing on building trusted relationships, having support, um, boundaries and expectations, all of that does matter and it does buffer young people against risk. We also know that the research backs up that theory that the more we can scaffold young people, it doesn't protect them completely, but it does allow them a little bit more resiliency in the face of risk. So again, the survey overview, we focus on a series of risk behaviors ranging from substance use to bullying and violence, and then the protective um, behaviors range from physical activity to sleep, screen time, and perceptions. Uh, the survey has proven to be reliable by the Centers for Disease Control. It also is a valid survey and it has been tested. There is internal reliability checks and the data is clean, so not every survey that is um, turned in actually is part of the, the final data pool. 77 surveys were removed from our data pool um, and that represents the final set of clean data. Um, so Coolidge and Parker participated in the survey in a similar way to what the high school did. Their wellness staff worked with administrators to set aside specific class block time. Parents were given the opportunity to opt their child out. Young people could also opt themselves out if they chose not to take the survey. Um, and then they were given the sufficient amount of time to do that. All of them did take the survey online this year. So just a, a quick review of the, the communities that are in the Middlesex League, um, all except for Lexington. So Arlington, Belmont, Burlington, Melrose, ourselves, Stone and Wakefield, Watertown, Wilmington, Winchester, and Woburn. A um, little bit about the online administration of the survey. I went over what surveys were removed. Um, so for the survey uh, results I'm gonna share with you, for middle school, there's less comparison data. Um, there is a national set of com comparison data for middle school and state, but the data does lag well behind um, our current results. So I chose not to include them, but we will have that updated as that data becomes available. So the comparisons I'm sharing with you tonight are just against the Middlesex League because that's what we have to be most reliable right now. So in terms of who took the survey, um, pretty good split between the three grades of, across both schools. Um, the racial profile, um, which is a combined uh, look at both middle and high schools representative of our district. When we start to think about some of the safety questions, we look at were young people using helmets when they were riding a bike, if they were riding a bike, do they use a helmet when skateboarding or rollerblading, and were they wearing a seatbelt? 
<clears throat> and you can see that um, our rates are pretty comparable to the Middlesex League. Um, but again, we want to make sure that we're continually reminding young people about helmet use and about safety, particularly in a, a community such as Reading where we have such a high rate of car usage and a lot of traffic in a small area sometimes. So just reminding parents to remind their kiddos. Sometimes they do great with helmet use in elementary and then they get up to middle school <coughs> and they kind of think they don't need them anymore. So we do have to keep reminding them about that. Um, this question is a similar question to what was asked at the high school level. Did you ride in a car with someone that had been drinking alcohol? 15% of the middle school students said they had been in a car with someone who had drank alcohol prior to driving. Um, the thing to keep in mind is all of these young people are, are not drivers themselves, so they're always getting a ride. Um, so the person they could have been driving with could have been an older person in their family, could have been a parent, could have been an older sibling. We don't, we don't ask the specifics of who was driving them. Um, but that rate is similar to um, the middle sex. We also ask the same stress questions that we ask at the high school level. And you can see it's very similar to what we saw at the high school level, that it's a lot of different factors that create stress for young people. Um, but again, I want to point out that social press pressures only represent 4% of what they describe as negative stress. And typically, when we think about young people, we often think about social pressure as being their number one stressor. So I think it's important to also think about these other pieces um, as very important. So school demands, because that's part of their life. That's what they're doing every day. Uh, parent family demands um, having a busy <coughs> schedule, getting enough sleep. 13% worrying about the future. And that's probably a little bit different than maybe it was uh, 10 or 15 years ago, um, that worrying about the future question has gotten more challenging as our society has gotten a little bit more directed in how, um, how we talk about future tracks for our young people. So something to think about um, that it can cause worry for some young people. When it comes to school stress, um, this is pretty similar to the high school, um, but a lot of young people struggle with just the, the pressure of keeping up with schoolwork. It also can be a harder transition for young people com coming from elementary up into sixth grade, that it can be an adjustment for what the different demands are. Um, the middle schools benefit from having the team-based model, which allows them to work with young people and have um, that advising kind of based approach, which allows them to talk through a lot of this stuff. But you can see it's a lot of the similar um, worries that the high schoolers have as well. Um, the question around non-suicidal self-injury, this is a question that asks if young people are hurting themselves purposely, but not intending to die. They're actually doing a more repetitive cutting or burning behavior. And that rate is currently 16%. That is down slightly 1%, um, but again, it's still <laughs> a number that we want to continue to decrease. Um, it is an area that um, staff are aware of and are trying to understand and make sure that we're identifying referring young people when, when we're able to. Um, suicidal ideation, so we ask a series of questions to get at um, what the, the thinking and the planning is around this very serious question. So young people are asked if they've seriously considered attempting suicide if they've made a plan about how they would attempt suicide and if they actually attempted. Unfortunately, 19% described be having serious considerations of suicide. Um, that's tough. That, that's a tough number of kids. Um, it is close to the 16% for the league rate, but it is up a little bit higher from our previous survey. Um, it does correspond to national numbers and our national picture of what's happening with young people. Um, luckily, the rate of actual attempts is still about the same but that tells us that more young people are thinking about it. Um, some of the research says that we have a higher number of young people who are experiencing depression, um, and that can lend itself to higher rates of suicidality sometimes, not always. So it's an area that we'll continue to look at and make sure that we're providing support and identification strategies. We also ask young people if they're already taking medicine or receiving treatment for a mental health or behavioral health problem. 12% are already say they're engaged in some form of treatment. Um, and that's, that's promising to know that. Um, we also want to continue to make that number higher. The national rate is um, for high school ages, about 20% should be at least engaged in some form of treatment. At the middle school, the rate ranges between 10 and 15%, so we're kind of right in the middle of where we should be. Um, these are a set of questions that ask about harassment. So, um, and they get into specific things of why they felt they were being harassed, so this is their perception of harassment. So 22% said that they had been harassed in some way. 
And of that 22%, um, these were the reasons they said they were harassed. 3% for their racial or ethnic background, 3% for unwanted sexual comments or attention, 4% uh, for someone thinking they were gay, lesbian, or bisexual, 7% about their group of friends that they hung out with, 10% specific to physical characteristics, and then other reasons was 10%. So you can see there's a wide range of things that are really troubling, and for some young people, it can be multiple things. If you have a young person who is gay, who is with a group of friends that maybe isn't as popular, who's struggling with their physical characteristic, they can kind of end up with a lot of those pieces and feel a little bit isolated. So that's why when we think about disparities in data, we also look specifically at if young people identify as a gay, lesbian, bisexual, are they reporting higher rates of harassment? So we look more specifically at what are the other disparities, and that came up at our last presentation. We'll be taking a deeper dive into the data to look at not just those, <laughs> that group of young people, but also racial and ethnic diversity, and does that impact the data? So it's another area we'll continue to explore in our data committee. Um, this question talks about being uncomfortable about a social media posting. 28% reported they felt uncomfortable about something that was posted about them. The frequency of that, 1% um, said almost daily, 1% um, one, one to two times a week, 1% one, one to two times in the past month, 13% a few times in the past year, and 12% previously. But if you think about those, you know, three or 4% of young people who it's happening in the current month, um, that's something that could be weighing on them quite heavily um, every day. And that corresponds to what we're seeing with electronic bullying or cyberbullying. Um, this rate has gone up significantly since the previous survey. It's actually doubled um, since the previous survey. And that has a lot to do with access to smartphones. We have more young people who have devices than they did two years ago. Um, so 33% reported experiencing some form of electronic bullying in the 12 months prior to the survey. Yeah, excuse me. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, apologies to interrupt, but that is like three times the number of the high school, which is 12%. Yep. When you reported two weeks ago. Yeah. Do we have any attribution of that? Do we have any thought? Is it just because they're new to electronics and they're not quite trained in it? Do we have anything else that we might attribute that to? It's developmental, so usually overall bullying rates are always higher at the middle school level, whether it's at school bullying or electronic bullying. So universally, those rates for that age group tend to be higher than high school. Maturity, sometimes first time with a device, but usually it's more about their inability to manage their relationships um, versus the high school, which are a tiny bit more mature. So, yeah, there is a definite shift. And you see the rates start to decline as they get older. That's why education at the right age is very important, kind of catching them before they reach the age and then also continuing to support them as they get through middle school. And our middle schools are doing a great job with that piece. But when we look at electronic bullying, 33%, which is very concerning, um, then we flip to being bullied on school property, the rate is 16%, which might seem concerning, but that rate is down from 31% um, since the last survey. So where that number went was to the electronic bullying. <laughs> so the behavior just shifted and went in a, a different place. Um, and it's important to understand that because that's where young people's lives are mainly is related to their connection to their devices and their life online. Um, being in a physical fight in the past 12 months prior to the survey, 29% um, reported that. Pretty close to the middle sex league rate. That's down 1%, so not hugely significant, but we'll take anything. <laughs> Any decrease is a good thing. Where's the amount? Um, carrying a weapon. Um, young people were asked if they've carried a weapon, such as a gun, knife, or club. 15% reported that they did. That's pretty comparable with the Middlesex League rate, um, and that's pretty comparable to the previous surveys. The next set of questions um, get into dating violence. Um, they ask a couple different questions to get at the data. So we ask young people if they're actually dating or not dating. Um, and then of the dating group, um, did they experience a specific form of dating violence? So 37% of middle schoolers said they were dating. Um, and that could mean lots of different things to them. <laughs> um, how they determine that is up to them. 6% say that they experienced some form of verbal ab abuse. 2% say they were forced to do sexual things they did not want to and 4% say they were hurt physically. So again, very important to have these conversations about relationships. 
um, and what is acceptable from a boundary standpoint for our young people. Um, and having those conversations early enough so that they have the opportunity to advocate for themselves and to come forward if they need to. Um, I went over this at the last presentation talking about as we work to create a healthier environment when it comes to risk, what we're trying to do is really turn the volume down or turn the heat down on as much risk as possible because it's already hard enough for young people to navigate this environment. So when it comes to substance abuse, one way that we can do that is to reduce access to substances and also not to encourage the use of substances by avoiding it or not talking about it. So when we get into vaping, 9% um, reported that they've tried a vaping product, 4% said that they currently use a vaping product. And that rate is higher than the last survey. Um, the availability of vaping products went up significantly in the past two years, but we also made progress in raising the age to 21. And then hopefully many of you heard the governor's ban for the next four months. We're very excited about that, but that doesn't mean vaping's going away because people will still continue to access illegal products and there will still be products in the marketplace. So we will continue our vigilance and continue our work on vaping prevention. Okay. Er yeah. Erica, so the, the talk radio and all has been talking about this a lot and uh, last couple days and the you know, the theme was, you know, they're going to go back to cigarettes and, and or, to your point, get stuff on the black market. I mean, uh, how are we uh, reacting to that? Uh, well, for right now, it helps definitely reduce access to have the ban in Massachusetts. It does make it a little bit harder for, especially younger people, for middle school especially. The harder it is to access the product, the less likely they are to use it. Um, so that is one plus. Um, it, there is the concern about young people going to New Hampshire um, and going to you know, nearby states, um, but we won't yet know how that's gonna play out until we start to see how, what the impact is gonna be. I do think young people are starting to understand the seriousness of the vaping illnesses. That's something that um, was not told to them by the companies that were selling them these products. Um, you know, they were told these products are harmless, these are safe for you to use, and now they're hearing about young people their age dying. So I think it does shift the conversation. I think it helps us as adults and parents have the conversation because it's in the news. Um, but it won't resolve the problem. It's, it's really temporary to see what can we do to protect our young people. The chemicals that are currently in the vaping products are part of the problem. And so the product that ends up being sold in Massachusetts could change over time. And that could be a benefit, not just for young people, but to adults. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. There are some lawsuits already pending from some of the folks that are in the marketplace. So it'll be interesting to see where it goes. Thank you. And we don't yet know what the enforcement will be for violating the vaping ban. We're gathering information to find out how that's gonna play out. So we will share that once we have that information. But it is still prohibited in schools. It always has been. It's an area that we we'll continue to work on. When it comes to underage drinking, 17% um, of our middle school teens reported trying alcohol and 2% say they currently use alcohol. Um, I wanna point out that for that area, it is up 4% since the last survey, and that is concerning because that is a rate that had been declining um, over the past 10 years. We, we also share that distinction of having a higher rate with Stoneham. Um, across the Middlesex League, Reading and Stoneham were the two that had the higher rates, and so that's an area that we wanna pay attention to and we wanna to continue to do education. When it comes to access to alcohol for middle school students, about a third of middle school students say they access alcohol through some family member. Oftentimes their family member doesn't know they've accessed it. <laughs> so it's just important to continue to keep an eye on what people have in their homes and also to talk to older siblings about not providing alcohol to their younger siblings as well as um, not having people buy for young people. Um, when it comes to substance misuse, 3% uh, reported that they tried marijuana. That's about the same rate for Middlesex League. 6% say they've tried inhalants. Inhalants is another access issue because inhalants can be found in any home. Um, they're household products. So it is important to just keep an eye on that and make sure you have conversations around safety. And particularly garages are an area that folks often forget about because we don't go into them a lot if they're stacked with all of our things for over many, many years and we don't even know some of the chemicals we have in there. So I encourage people to try to clean out and at least know what you have so you would know if something's missing. 
4% reported taking prescription medications not prescribed to them to get high. Um, that's an area that, again, we want to have, continue to have conversations with young people about never sharing medication, not taking it not prescribed, and also not mixing medications with other substances. Um, as we get into sexual behavior, this question is a newer question. Um, as you know, sexting has become a more common place behavior. 14% reported sending or receiving sexual messages. Um, that's concerning, and again, more young people having access to phones and social media mean the ability of pictures circulating is more significant than it was two, four, or six years ago. Um, the rates for middle school sexual behavior are quite, quite low, um, but again, we, can, we do need to do the education and the, and the training and, uh, and have young people understand the seriousness of um, understanding their boundaries and their safety. 5% reported being sexually active. Uh, that's a little bit higher than the middle sex leak rate. And then we also have a portion of those young people who clearly did not consent um, as they were under age 10 when they were first um, having sex. So that's the area of abuse that we also need to talk about as a community and continue to do work on. And that's a tough topic for us to acknowledge as parents. It's a tough topic to acknowledge as a community, but we are not alone in that. It's, it's an, a part of our society that we, we have to continue to uh, place attention on. And luckily, our police department and our schools, they do have the training and support. Um, but for many people who are dealing with this, it's often very hard for them to come forward. Any questions before I keep moving? Yeah. yeah. I'm just wondering, um, I'm, I'm so disturbed, obviously, by some of these numbers. And I'm so glad you're here working on them, keeping us focused. Um, and I'm, I'm hesitant to ask this because the answer might be completely confidential, so I'm trying to phrase it broadly. Mm -hmm. So that 2%, does the staff feel like they have a sense that those kids are already on their radar? Or is this more than they thought were there? I don't know if I'm phrasing that well yeah. enough. So I did have a conversation with our detectives unit about the number of child cases, child sexual abuse cases that they see. And we, we typically see one to three case, cases a year, so the rate is quite low. Um, but it's a very underreported set of circumstances. So that's the tricky thing is um, our staff are trained um, to have conversations with young people. But typically 10 to 15 years after the abuse is when someone might actually start to think about having a conversation or bringing it forward to law enforcement we're starting to talk about it in therapy so it's not something that often when it's happening people are able to talk about because they're often living with or are very close to the person that is unfortunately abusing them but dcf is also part of that process and if there's ever a, sus a suspicion of any type that is reported and followed through on Officer Vatcher, if you have anything to add on, I mean, we have a whole protocol and procedure, sexually assault trained investigators. <clears throat> when they're old, when they're a little bit older, yeah. Because again, if you're younger, you may not understand what it all means. Do we have a translation of, and forgive me if I should be able to do this in my head, but 2%, like around how many kids is that? Um, about 890 or so took the survey. Um, okay, thank you. And not every young person answers every question, so it would be under a dozen, I would say. Thank you. But, but you can see for the Middlesex League, the rate is 1%, so there's usually going to be at least some, unfortunately. We also do have in our region, the Middlesex District Attorney's Office has a pediatric SANE unit, which is a sexually assault trained a nurse examiner unit, and they have a lot of special folks that are trained to deal with these cases if they do come forward when they're young. Um, so we have the resources available, and so if anyone ever has a concern, they can bring it forward to our detectives or to their school, and, and they will definitely be taken care of and walk through the process. 
screen time. <laughs> so we've talked a lot about devices so far. <laughs> um, about 32% say that they spent three or more hours a day for something that was not schoolwork, including iBox, uh, I'm sorry, iBox, Xbox, <laughs> um, iPad, being on the phone, social media, that kind of stuff. Um, missing breakfast. Um, about 6% say they didn't eat breakfast in all seven days. That's actually decent um, compared to if you remember our high school numbers. So as they get older, they start skipping more breakfast. So if we could keep the breakfast going, that would be amazing. Um, when it comes to disordered eating, um, these are a set of questions that look at behaviors that sometimes lead to eating disorders. So 1% of our middle schoolers reported taking diet pills, powders, or liquids without a doctor's orders to lose weight. 2% um, uh, made themselves vomit or take laxatives, which is a bulimic type behavior. Um, and 5% did not eat for 24 hours or more, or that fasting behavior, that can be very dangerous. So again, it's also important because kids are so busy, we've seen with the fasting behavior, it tends to be kids who are going, 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 and sometimes are forgetting to take their snack to have a minute to do what they need to do, especially if they're physically active. So just keeping on reminding kids to be eating every couple of hours. Physical activity, as you can see, such a high number of our young people are engaged in physical activity, which is such a healthy, protective behavior, 95%, which is uh, exactly what our Middlesex League rate is. Um, and that's really important, but also brings up the importance of eating breakfast and continuing to, to stay nourished. Concussions. So for concussions, we started asking about concussions uh, last cycle, so in 2017 was the first time we asked. And in 2017, the rate was 12%, so it has gone up 4%. Um, so that is an area to continue to keep an eye on. Um, I know that we're starting as a society to understand concussions a little bit more. We have more research that tells us more about it. There's more protocols on, for school around safety and taking time out. Um, but it is important to know that that rate has gone up slightly. Um, so just an area to keep an eye on and also for planning for school support if they have a higher number of kids who may be concussed and may need extra support. Trusted adults. Um, we ask questions about is there a teacher or other adult in your school that you feel like you can talk to about a problem? 58% um, said that they had that. 14% uh, said they're not sure and 20% said no. Some young people didn't answer the question, so it doesn't exactly add up. Um, and one of the things with this particular question is you know, some young people say they're not sure because it depends on what the problem is as to why they would bring it to school versus a parent versus maybe a coach. Outside of school, is there an adult or other adults you can talk to about things that are important to you? 87% say that they have that person. 8% um, not sure, and only 5% say no. So that's good to know that most of our young people have that trusted adult. We want to continue to get that number as close to 100% as we can. Sleep, such an important thing. <coughs> so 56%, a little more than half are getting eight or more hours, which is great. But that is a 4% decrease since the last survey that we had. Um, and the research is showing that as young people get more devices, there's rate of sleep goes down. Many young people sleep with their devices. Um, so we remind parents if they can to try to take the devices out of the bedroom and also do what they can to remind them to get that eight hours because it is so important for all kinds of protective behaviors. There's so much research that says um, sleep actually corresponds to less risk behavior. Perception of parental disapproval. Um, the set of questions from the next few slides focuses on how young people perceive what their parents think, their peers think, and also what they think about risk, risk of harm related to certain substances. So for this slide, we asked young people did they perceive their parents would disapprove of a specific behaviors. One was would their parents disapprove if they smoked tobacco, 98% say their parents would, drink alcohol daily, 96%, marijuana, 97%, and use prescription drugs not prescribed to you, 97%. Those are really strong numbers, which is amazing. And the, the research shows that the higher those numbers are, typically the lower um, your actual use numbers are for young people trying substances. So that's really important that parents are making that clear to their young people. Perception of peer disapproval. Um, the rates are slightly lower than the parental rates, but they're still pretty high and pretty strong. Um, when that social norm in the peer group is that you don't use, that obviously is a protective factor. 
And then perception of risk. Oh, sorry. One question, sorry. Yeah. I keep going back and forth between last time and this time. That's okay. Um, and the, the marijuana one in particular is stark. Yes. Right? Uh, mm -hmm. The high school one was 43% yep. of peers didn't think it was a problem. And in middle school, it's 89%. Yes. Is there, I asked the same question, do we attribute that to something? Again, is it maturity? Is it, you know, the recent changing of the laws? Is it something else where they think they're okay now because they're older? Do we have anything along those lines? Um, the research over the last five years has shown that between the decriminalization of marijuana to a bylaw in 2009 up until the most recent changes of recreational use for over 21 has definitely affected social norms for kids that are over 14. So it absolutely has had an impact. Um, those rates vary across different states that have different laws. Um, and like, for example, Colorado, when they did a study of their rates, um, the per peer disapproval rate was around 20%. Um, so, unfortunately, that rate does decrease as your laws relax. Good question. Thank you. Okay, to move forward? Okay. So, perception of risk or harm. <coughs> so, this is um, asking young people if they perceive a moderate or great risk of physical harm to these specific behaviors. So, smoking one or more packs of cigarettes daily, 93% using e-cigarettes or vaping devices, 84%. What's interesting about this one is that n young people now are starting to understand that they are getting the equivalent of a pack of cigarettes in one vape pod. And so I do think over time, the vaping perception of risk and harm will, t will go up, which will, be help which will be good for us. But again, we have to get that information out to young people about what it means to vape and how much nicotine is actually in one of those pods that you are actually ingesting a pack of cigarettes. 82% um, um, said that they perceived drinking five or more drinks uh, of alcohol one or two times a week to be a moderate or great risk of physical harm. The rate for marijuana is slightly lower, but still decent. Um, prescription drugs, 93%, which is important that young people do understand that if those drugs aren't prescribed to them, that that can be unsafe. Looking at health education, the majority of young people um, report getting health education in alcohol and drug prevention and in bullying prevention. The rates for HIV AIDS prevention are slightly lower. Um, that's an area that's addressed less at, the, less at the middle school level, but that's an area that we can be looking at um, for improvement to make sure that that's developmentally appropriate and young people are getting the minimum safety information that they need. So in terms of school support, these are areas that we talked about last time, and this is something that is much better left to our principals and our administrators about the amazing work that they're doing. But some areas that you know and are very familiar with is the social-emotional learning integration that's happening, the individual and team-based support, um, the health education work that's going on in the middle schools, our youth mental health first aid training for staff, our interface referral service for families, and I also have some cards here if anyone would like them and our Elliott Mobile Crisis Service for students, particularly those that might have suicidal ideation, that's a service that our school can call and work with parents to have someone come out and do an assessment. Um, next steps, we'll be working with our district data committee, and I believe that's something that um, our superintendent and assistant superintendent will be working with us on to put together a great team to look deeper at the data. Uh, we will be doing parent, uh, par parent presentations and community presentations, and then we'll be looking at bringing students together to talk about the information and also provide insight. Any questions? I just, I had a comment and I didn't want to interrupt you before you okay. talked about the bike. Oh, I should have asked permission. Mm -hmm. Sorry. You talked about the bike helmets. Yes. Um, and last night at the Rakasa annual meeting, um, Chris Heron's movie pointed out how powerful role modeling is and thinking about what we'd want our younger brother, nephew, grandson, whatever it is to do. And I can't help but comment, because it's a thing for me, how many families I see out for bike rides with the kids wearing helmets and the parents not. And um, thinking about what you said, you said they don't think they need to wear one anymore because they get the message that people age out of wearing their helmets. And I think, I think there's a correlation between the role modeling of wearing those helmets and the idea that kids don't need to once they get to a certain age. And I can't help 
but make that point mm -hmm. because I know people who have, I almost lost my own husband to a bike accident and he was wearing his helmet and he had broken ribs and a punctured lung, but his head was intact because the helmet hit. So it's just really important to think about that role modeling behavior and I'd love to see our number of kids rise who Absolutely. say they wear helmets and be proud of it. Yes. And I know that's something that our police department has been working on is promoting helmet use. And over the summer, they did tons of work on promoting helmet use and stopping and acknowledging young people for wearing their helmets and giving them um, you know, good citations uh, for, for wearing their helmets. But maybe we need to up the ante for, for our adults <laughs> and encourage that uh, because it is so important. Um, to keep us all safe. I mean, we all know the number of cars that are on our roads in Reading, so uh, just from a safety standpoint. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I really am interested that you're sharing this data with students because I imagine in some ways, if you are a student with an outlying experience or perception, to see the data and realize that the thing that I believe is safe or okay is very much outside the norm of my peers could be a powerful moment. So I'm just wondering, do you have any description of how students are going to be able to access and hear this data? Um, at, the, at the high school, we've used it in health classes, so they actually do projects with the data, and um, the health teachers work with me to bring in um, specific highlights, and we also work with the child development class um, on using some of the data, particularly around child development. Um, and so that's very interesting, because they're kind of looking at the data to also look at how do you um, approach prevention, how do you approach intervention, and then also reflecting on their own behaviors. I find it very interesting to talk with young people because oftentimes if they are in a peer group where everyone is using, they think everyone uses. And so when they see that 70% are not reporting that, um, I think it's helpful for them to know that, that that's out there. And also for some young people that maybe don't know about it, it helps raise the awareness that to not make comments lightly about those kind of things because other people could be struggling, whether it's stuff in their family or other things like that. So I find it really exciting to work with students on it. At the middle school level, it's something we could talk about. I, I know there's all kinds of work happening, but I'd love to find a way for us to figure out how we could do more work with students. Officer Batcher and I are gonna be visiting the middle schools to work on vaping prevention projects. Um, so maybe there's a way we can, we can work in the data. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, uh, so now uh, we will have the uh, superintendent's evaluation and I'm gonna, uh, this is uh, an annual process by uh, state law and I'm gonna have uh, Ms. Borowski who uh, compiled the data and uh, ran point on it uh, to make the presentation. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, um, the start of this section of the packet, there's an evaluation called the Reading School Committee. It's the superintendent evaluation for the 2018-19 school year by the Reading School Committee, and it's dated June 23rd. So that's the one we're going to be discussing tonight. Um, I want to start by addressing that date. This is a little bit unusual this year. Um, the, the summative school committee evaluation is based on the individual evaluations done by the individual members of the school committee. We did that work last May and then I compiled them um, in June. So we are looking at data um, and the perceptions of the school committee that go back easily five months, often based on data that goes back even further. So this is an unusual evaluation cycle. Um, and just to clarify for anyone who doesn't know why that is, right at the time that we were ready to do the evaluation, Dr. Doherty had to go on leave and was gone for the summer. So this has really been our first opportunity, practically speaking, to do the evaluation with Dr. Doherty. So that explains the lag, but it's a bit atypical. So I wanted to start with that. My apologies ahead of time to everyone at this table who's already heard this, but on the off chance that there's anybody watching this who doesn't understand the process, I do feel compelled to kind of describe the process for superintendent evaluation, and then we'll dive into the actual presentation. Um, so in the state of Massachusetts, the Department of Education provides school committees with this rubric that we use, so it's the standard across the state for the school committee as a body to evaluate the performance of the superintendent of schools, and it is a requirement that that evaluation is conducted in open session. So this is something that we do every year. Um, the process 
is the chair or the chair can appoint someone, um, in this case the chair asked that I would do it, um, to take the individual evaluations and there's some very clear strict rules around this. We have to each conduct our, we have to complete our individual evaluation completely independently and the only person who sees them is the person who's compiling. Typically correspondence would be copied to the chair, not in this instance. The only person who sees it is the compiler who then takes it um, and is tasked with creating one evaluation from the, from the disparate individual evaluations to create one evaluation that reflects the consensus of the committee. So my process, and I've shared this before, um, any time that there was a rating like did not meet some progress, significant progress, I, atta I attached a numerical value to that. Zero would be the lowest and then up to however the highest, four or five. Um, I put in a, an Excel spreadsheet with each one of your names. Um, and then for each category or goal, I plugged in the number that correlated to the ranking you gave, added them together, divided them by the number of evaluations, and that gave me the average school committee rating. If it was under 0.5, I rounded down. If it was above 0.5, I rounded up. So I really tried to keep the ratings as scientific and as passionate as possible. The harder part is the narrative, obviously. Um, so my process with that, um, I took the very shortest evaluation because it's the easiest place to start, and I take a legal pad, just a legal pad, and I make bulleted list of um, sort of areas of commendation and areas for development for each of the sections. When I'm finished with that, I go to the second evaluation, and I, I do the same exact thing. If they make the same point, I put a check, which means now two people have made that comment. If they make a different point, it gets added to the list, and so on. What I'm left with is a big pile of notes with check marks and I can see that three or more school committee members made this comment so that makes it into the summative. As a matter of transparency, all of our individual evaluations are in this packet, they're posted to the website. So if anyone's curious, you can read our individual evaluations. Um, but the summative, I tried to only include narrative that was reflective of a consensus point of view. Um, in terms of the timing, um, I would like to say that there is one evaluation in here um, by Elaine Webb, who obviously was a member of this committee five months ago and no longer is, so um, she has an evaluation in here. Um, I also, for anyone who's interested, we had one member of the, the committee, Mr. Parks, who had been elected in April and we started this process in May and made the determination to not complete an evaluation for Dr. Doherty. And I just wanted to say that that's a very typical decision. We've had several school committee members who've made that choice in the past and MASA guides that that is a perfectly acceptable decision to make. So I just wanted to clarify that. So um, the summative was based on five evaluations, not a full six. So I'm gonna pause there if there are any questions on process or law around this. All right, so we'll conduct, we'll, we'll dive right in uh, to the evaluation um, for this year. Um, Dr. Doherty has three sets of goals, professional practice goals, student learning goals, and district improvement goals. And I should say to anyone, I'm going right through the document, so feel free to follow along on paper. Um, it was the committee's opinion that Dr. Doherty met his professional practice goal and made significant progress towards the student learning and district improvement goals. Um, on the performance standards, which are instructional leadership, management and operations, family and community engagement, and professional culture, the committee deemed that Dr. Doherty was proficient across the board. Um, there are four categories, unsatisfactory, needs improvement, proficient and exemplary. Um, getting into the narrative a little bit, um, it's clear that Dr. Doherty is committed to the students of Reading and has a diligent work ethic. Um, the committee commended the two significant awards that he received outside of Reading for his work as a superintendent last year. Um, and as I mentioned, there, there was a sense of meeting or significant progress towards the, the goals. Um, to specify the goals, I'm now on page three. Um, there were three subsets of the student learning goal. Um, one was about improving the safety, both physical and psychological safety of our schools. The second one was um, a, re a reorganization of um, central office. Yes, thank you, central office. I just had a moment that I was reading the wrong thing. I am reading the right thing. Thank you, Mr. Wise. Um, yes, a reorganization of central office that, that sort of redefined roles um, and sort of a structural reorg. And then finally, um, working on a multi-year capital plan 
uh, to improve school facilities were sort of the three big um, professional practice goals, and the committee felt that Dr. Doherty met all of those goals. The next section is the student learning goals. Overall, the committee felt that Dr. Doherty met these, um, but within the focus area, there was sort of a little bit of, of um, a difference between significant progress and having met. So when it came to closing the achievement gap and mathematics practice, the committee felt that significant progress had been made. When it came to literacy and social emotional learning, the committee felt that that goal had been met. Um, but overall, uh, generally, the student learning goals had been met. So that's the first chunk of the evaluation, and it's on goals um, and how the committee deemed that Dr. Doherty um, got the district where we needed to be in the last year. The next set of the evaluation is on four um, performance standards. These have been identified by the states as the performance standards that a uh, high-performing superintendent of school needs. So the first is instructional leadership. Obviously, it should be instructional leadership. Um, the school committee felt that Dr. Doherty was proficient um, across the board um, in the areas of curriculum, instruction, assessment, and evaluation. Um, the one exemplary in this area was data-informed decision-making. Um, particular areas that came out in the narratives throughout the committee, uh, with three or more committee members mentioning, was Dr. Doherty's leadership in social-emotional learning, an exemplary use of data to inform decisions, the implementation of the curriculum coordinator positions as a result of the override, um, the development and implementation of curriculum guides was mentioned by several committee members as a highlight this year, um, the variety of assessments used throughout the district, um, 2018 MCAS results, which led to strong accountability levels for all Reading Public Schools. Um, several committee members specifically mentioned the improvement at the Joshua Eaton School. Um, the work done on the bridge program, the use of the workshop model at the elementary level, continued utilization of the advisory program, the successful NEASC process at the high school, and the significant and sustained increase in the percentage of high school students accessing high-level math. There have been several years of sustained increase in that area. Moving on to the next section. Um, standard number two is around the area of management and operations. Again, the school committee feel, feel that Dr. Doherty's performance has been proficient, um, particularly in the areas of human resources management, scheduling, and management of information system, and law ethics and policies. Um, the committee did feel that in terms of school environment and fiscal systems that Dr. Doherty's performance was exemplary. So those were two highlights in this area. Um, it's clear that there's a focus in our district on a respectful culture in all of our schools. Um, the focus on addressing all areas of the safety of our students, their health, their emotional and social safety as well as their physical safety. Um, Dr. Doherty's level of integrity and consideration of laws, ethics and policies. Um, a very important thing that happened last year is the successful negotiation of all collective bargaining agreements. Um, and they're all three-year agreements, I believe. Mm -hmm. So that really starts, sets a period of stability moving forward. So that was a very important accomplishment last year that was mentioned by several committee members. Um, several committee members felt that Dr. Doherty's ability to hire and manage a strong central office leadership team and excellent building principles is one of his greatest strengths, and we recognize that. Um, the reorganization of central office, I already mentioned that, was seen as a highlight. Um, a couple, several, obviously more than three, three or more, uh, several school committee members mentioned that they saw central office leadership personnel speaking more publicly and that they appreciated that. They liked to see more faces and more voices representing the district. So um, that was received positively by the committee. Um, the strong collaborative working relationship with municipal counterparts across our town government, the successful capital funding from town meeting for necessary field updates and important school security initiatives, and exemplary budget development and management. Um, those were all seen as highlights in areas of management and operations last year. Um, standard number three is family and, uh, family and community engagement. The committee felt that Dr. Doherty's um, performance in this area was proficient. Um, the committee specifically mentioned Dr. Doherty has a tendency to publicly express gratitude to his staff um, and ongoing efforts to publicize their work and their success. So that was received um, favorably. Um, ongoing communication via weekly newsletters and blogs, high level of availability to the public through both regular office hours and your willingness to meet one-on-one -on -one with parents, and um, 
Obviously, we continued last year to struggle with the problem of hateful graffiti in our schools, and the comprehensiveness of the response that Dr. Doherty led was considered to be um, very strong by the committee. Um, there was one area that several committee members would like to see focused on in the future, and that's working through engaging the public before changes are made, um, and anticipating that this is a change that may impact the public, and therefore, how do we get out ahead of it instead of reacting to feedback after a change has been made? Um, um, so that was one area the committee felt that could be a focus area for next year. The last standard is professional culture. Um, in the area of commitment to high standards, continuous learning and shared vision, Dr. Doherty was viewed by the committee to be exemplary. And in the areas of cultural proficiency, communication, and managing conflict proficient um, for an overall rating of proficient. Um, it is clear that Dr. Doherty is committed to a professional culture in the schools. Um, he was marked proficient in this area, but several committee members would like to see conflict management as a focus for the upcoming year. Um, so, thank you, Dr. Doherty. It was um, a strong evaluation. I'll certainly take any questions or concerns from, from Dr. Doherty or any of the members. Did you have? I just have a comment. I don't have any questions. <laughs> Since, since I had a chance to read this for a while. <laughs> um, I just want to say, first of all, thank you to the committee. I know how time consuming this process is for all of you, and especially Ms. Borowski, who does double the work. Um, so thank you very much. And all of you took it very seriously, which is important to me because the purpose of the tool is to help me improve as a superintendent. Um, I do want to say, though, that this evaluation is not just reflective of the work I do. It is reflective of the work of everyone sitting at this table. Um, and I do want to mention that Sharon Stewart last year was, was part of that. And I know Jen is going to continue that great work um, as well. And in our building principals and directors and staff, um, you know, this is a, an evaluation of me. But however, there's a lot of people that contributed to the success of the school district. So I just want to say thank you to everyone. For that. Thank you. Does anyone else have any narrative they'd like to add to Jean's? Thank you, Jean. Of course. Thank you. Can I just say out yes. loud? Ca uppercase, thank you, Ms. Borowski, it because really that was a Herculean task. It really is an honor, and I know you put a lot of faith in me doing it, so thank you for placing it in there. And I was also impressed by. Um, six evaluations and each of us was so different in the way we approached it and what we included but we came up with similar evaluations in the end but um, it really did manifest us all working focusing and bringing out our priorities and and our personalities I think in how we wrote it I apologize for all my narrative, but I'm a much more qualitative assessor. <laughs> but thank you for doing that. Thank you. Are you ready for a motion, Ms. Kitchen? I am. Okay. Move to approve the superintendent's end of cycle summative evaluation report for the 2018-19 school year. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Five zero. Thank you. Got a question out there, Dr. Yes. Dr. Farm. <clears throat> Jeffrey Carr, Ridge Road. Um, just had two quick comments to make. I thank you, all school committee members, for the work that you did in putting this together. Um, as former treasurer of Yes for Reading, the override uh, committee from a couple years ago, one point I did want to emphasize with, was that Dr. Doherty did, in fact, spend the money as he had promised in the presentations leading up to. So that was the full, last year was the first full year using that override money that, you know, we told the voters we needed it and, you know, it was spent according to that plan. Um, the other point was on the NEOSC reaccreditation at RMHS, which was noted. I also wanted to point out that um, Dr. Doherty and the uh, administration had pushed uh, NEOSC to uh, optimize their uh, accreditation process. And there was some, you know, that we, we sort of told NEOSC we weren't, we didn't like the process before, and we were a little slow, and there was some pushback from the community, hey, we're, we're going to not be accredited. Um, and ultimately, things were resolved. We got a much better evaluation process that the, was more 
helpful for the high school in terms of less demands on their time and more uh, positive work to go. And I think that was something that, you know, Dr. Doherty helped uh, push the district and me ask in that direction. Thank you for the observation. Yes. Just really quickly, I, I would feel remiss if I didn't say thank you to Dr. Doherty for the blood, sweat, and tears that he's invested at a very hard time in our world and in our schools of taking us from a place that was very difficult, working so hard on the override, getting the money, as Dr. Quorum said, spending it in the right way, being at the states we could influence um, processes and, and what's expected of us. And I just wanted to say thank you and, and reiterate how much I hate this public process, <laughs> but thank you. voted on the motion. Yeah. Got some collaborative boards. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Darty, do you want to just sure. give some um, color on as that? As you know, we belong to two special education collaboratives, the North Shore Education Consortium and the SEAM Collaborative. Uh, both are uh, guided by uh, state law on uh, special education collaboratives. And a mm, few years ago when the law changed, the school committees in all of the communities that are represented had to vote on a set of articles of agreement uh, which specify a whole set of rules and regulations that we have to follow. And one of those is that annually um, the school committee has to reappoint uh, the, the, stu the superintendent who is um, representing uh, the, this district on those two collaboratives. So this is an annual appointment that happens. You did uh, something similar the last few years. Motion? Yes. Uh, move to appoint Superintendent John F. Doherty as the Reading Public Schools representative to the Board of Directors of the North Shore Educational Consortium for the 2019-2020 school year. I'll second. I'll second it. I just wanted to point out you behind you there was a hand. Yeah, no, after the, yeah. After, after the, the motions? motions. Yep. Okay, you want to read the second one then? Or? No, 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 this no. one. Go ahead. Um, so, the, you know, so this is my first time doing this, so I'll ask the question. Um, since both, I believe both of these are special education related consortiums, right? Uh, they also have professional development pieces to them as well. Okay. Um, and I think in, in your other announcements, we've been talking about how to manage work life and things like that. So. In conscious, conscious effort of that and in conscious effort of having a new director of student services, is it mandatory that it's the superintendent or would it be also potentially possible to be the director of student services? No, um, it has to be the superintendent. Uh, depending on how the article is written, it has to be the superintendent or a school committee member. Um, both of these boards are superintendent okay. uh, boards. The, uh, the directors actually also have their own meetings that yes. they attend with, the, with each collaborative as do the assistants as do the assistants and other job alikes too yeah. actually okay thank you any other questions all those oh, yes dr quorum jeffrey quorum again so if we don't appoint you then we would have no represent you would not have <laughs> representation okay <laughs> <laughs> said this one it's a superintendent by these are superintendent yeah. only there are some that are mixed all those in favor of the motion five zero I I second complete. motion move to appoint superintendent john f doherty as the reading public schools representative to the board of directors of the seam collaborative for the 2019-2020 school year There's second second by mr wise any other discussion all those in favor Zero. Can I do the brochure? Yes. Okay. Um, I'll put the motion on the table and then you can discuss. Move to approve the school committee informational brochure. Is there a second? Second. So uh, this was uh, brought forward by uh, Dr. Doxter uh, and recently. Uh, had some edits by uh, Ms. Borowski and Dr. Dari as well. So and I don't know if everyone's had a time, 
had an opportunity to look at it, but I'll open up the floor for any discussion. Yes. I have one. Um, after this packet was published, an eagle-eyed staff member brought to our attention that there is an error that I'd like to propose as a friendly amendment. Mm -hmm. Under school committee meetings, um, third paragraph down, it says the agenda is planned by the school committee chair and vice chair along with the superintendent and his team. The agenda is available 48 hours ahead online at, and it says the Reading Public Schools website. It's actually available on the town website. So I would just propose that we replace the www.reading.k12.ma.us with um, at the Reading Town Hall website. So it's not it's it's not on both. I think no, the agenda has to be posted legally on the, the town, town website. Okay. We put the packets on the pack. That's the, right. Yeah, but this is the agenda. Any other comments? Yes. Um, I, as is usual, I continue editing my own work and I really was very grateful for the feedback that I got on this. Um, so I wanted to, it's partially a question. Um, the, under the school committee contact information, we invite letters and I was thinking that um, it would be helpful for people to know that when they send a letter to the whole school committee, that it's likely, not definitely, but likely to become a, pos a public record. And so, um, and published in the school committee packets. So I was wondering about um, adding a line to that saying, notices to whole, whole committee, um, whole committee might are likely to be considered public record. I don't like when people are surprised. Technically they're public record anyway when they go into our email box. Right? So it's whether it's a whether it's a publicly posted public record or it's a public record. But technically once they go into our email box it's a public record. Right. Okay. So my question was, though, that not everyone would be, it depends what the content is, because we wouldn't make public a comment about a staff member or someone under contract, um, the staff. So I wasn't sure on that technicality. But I wanted people to be aware that their, what they send to all of us is a public record. So maybe to Mr. Wise's point, um, <coughs> notices to the whole committee are considered public record, period. Notices to any one of us. If they send an email to any one of our public official emails, whether That's it's the whole committee or not, it's public record. That's true. I was just looking for a way to warn them that it yeah. might. Because yeah. I mean, to I'm, us individually, it's not going into the packet. I kind of, I mean, Sorry, Chuck, I guess we're sure, open. No, so. right. <laughs> I kind of feel like it's a little bit, I mean, I don't know if the right word is overkill, but it is, they're emailing a public official, right? I mean, by definition, when they email us, they're emailing a public official. So in that regard, it's a public record. If you want to say may be posted in the packet or will, or will be posted in the packet once we respond, as we discussed on 711, and we will provide feedback, and you know, but then you're coming into verbiage and how much space do you have, right? Yeah. So I think it's, I mean, in the essence of what this is, it's what our role is, what's what our job is, it's things like that. I kind of think it's out of scope, that's my view, but I'm open to a shorter version if there's a way to say it. Ms. Barras. I tend, I tend to agree with Mr. Wise on this because I think if you say these are public records, they'll likely be in the packet, my immediate question is, well, who decides whether they're packed. And then describing how that decision is made and the law around it is way more than we can get into in a brochure. So I do think it could open some questions that we don't have the space to answer here. Um, so I tend to agree, I don't think it's necessary. I, I, maybe the solution is a simple sentence at the end of use the above email to reach all school committee members in the superintendent of schools period. Emails to the school committee are public records, period. That, that is a fact and that should be enough to make you realize this email is public. 
I love that. Part of what I wanted to be really careful about is this is meant to invite, the brochure is meant to invite people to, to approach us, and I didn't want to deter that. Right, right, right. right. But I also didn't want them to be blindsided. Right. So I, I love that um, verbiage. Okay. Ms. Borowski, <laughs> English teacher. <Yeah. laughs> Did you get that, Mrs. Engels? Well, we haven't voted on Oh, that, if, so. okay. Sorry. Right. Yeah, so do we vote one at a time on? Hold on, as amended. Okay, so do all the amendments. Okay. Yes, Dr. McClellan. Jeffrey Crum again. So I just noticed that there's, you know, the five members listed here. Are you going to then have to re-vote when you add the next member back in, does it have to be revoted, or can you somehow make account for that? You know, when the appointment happens, and also on the second page, there's one instance of superintendent that is not capitalized, and all of the rest of them are. So, where is that? I will. Um, let's see. Sent on the second page, middle column, the third paragraph. The school committee evaluates only the superintendent. The superintendent. Even so English teachers make mistakes. <laughs> Yes. Uh, so here's my thought on that, and I'll certainly, if anyone has a different opinion, I think that no substantive change should be made to this without a vote of the school committee. I think changing a phone number, changing an email address, removing former school committee members and putting new ones right. in, I think falls under housekeeping. I don't think we need to vote. That is my sense. I agree. Okay. Yes. And to that point, we talk about there being six school committee members and this brochure lists five for an obvious reason because we're missing um, we are missing mrs well, we, webb we will hold the brochure print until the there's a full complement of the committee and the that's committee. great and then um oh, can i add one other thing um i really appreciated the picture of the students that was put on the second page um, in my, in, I really did, um, in my envisioning of the brochure and its purpose to invite people to know us and know what we do, why we're here, I was envisioning a picture of the school committee there so that people, we would be recognizable, we're real people, we're volunteers. Um, and so I think that putting our picture there now before we have our six members is premature. But if we are going to have our sixth member in October, if there'd be a way to take that picture, maybe then, or maybe um, have a regular time each year when we take that picture to update the brochure. In my mind, my vision for this, and I, I'm curious to know other people's vision, is that this will be a work um, that will be updated, so I picture us printing it in the schools in color and printing more when we need them, not going and spending money to print <clears throat> millions of these, but to have them for when we're going to be at the town fair, when we're going to be at um, the Friends and Family Day or other places so that we have these available and they're available in the schools central office or, or wherever, but um, so that we don't overprint and then we can update with the new school committee members' names. So, yes, Mr. Park. I, I respect that, but I think we are all here for the students, so I actually enjoy seeing the students there. Uh, that's, you know, our position is we're here for the students and the betterment of the students. So it's nice to see the students in this. My opinion. I can't, I can't argue with that. <laughs> um, and I don't know whether um, when this brochure was first made, the um, picture of the bell at the high school was added because that was a really big thing when I first was working on this. Yeah. Sorry? In 2016, yeah. 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 Um, and so that's another place if that, if we want pictures of students too, there's, there's an option there. Um, so, or that could be where the school committee picture <coughs> goes on the cover and then 
the students stay because I love the students being a part of it as well. So I hate having my photo taken. Start with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but seriously, seriously, um, I think on the front, I actually, my inclination is I like the kind of iconic, the bell in front of the high school. It's sort of the, the one school that all the students go to. So I, I kind of like the iconic one of our buildings. And I, I think I feel, I think I agree with Mr. Parks that having students represented is nice. Um, I don't have very strong feelings either way, but I'm happy with it the way it is. And if that's easier, I guess I would lean to the path of least resistance. Yes. A couple other points or notes, and this may be more substantive that might cause us to go back to the drawing board a little bit. Um, but I notice in here, there's nothing about the school committee establishing or collaborating to create goals for the, for the superintendent. It says we review the district improvement plan, but there's nothing that says we establish or create goals and collaborate with the superintendent on goals in the goal setting process. There's nothing in here that says we're responsible for policy. It says the superintendent implements our policy, but not that we're responsible for creating, reviewing, keeping up to date policy, which is one of our major tenets and what we're supposed to be doing. And there's nothing in here that says we approve the budget, right? It, and that's a technical word there, I suppose. There is stuff about working with and reviewing and within certain things, um, legal mandates and whatnot. We, it says create, the superintendent, finan chief financial officer create it, but it doesn't say that we actually approve it, and that is our job. So those three core tenets of what we do aren't technically listed in this thing <laughs> and would require pretty significant adjustments to get them in here. And then some other minor things um, in, in alignment with Dr. Coram's point, school committee is ha capitalized in most places, but not in some places. And committee is capitalized in some places, but not in some places places as well so from a consistency perspective we might want to look at that um, in particular it's the second paragraph of the middle section on the second page um, was jumping out at me but there's other places I'm sure we could look at so those are just substantive goals policy budget are substantive and they're just they're not there and that's definitely more than we can do tonight yeah I actually um, so under school committee's job mm -hmm. It says, um, provide leadership and over oversight, creating and updating school policies and guidelines that benefit the health, education, and welfare of students, as well as the operations of schools. Well, they're good. Work with the superintendent, chief financial officer in town to create the best school budget possible within the constraints of legal mandates, available funds, and educational priorities. So create is there, but the, de the technicality of what we do is approve, and maybe we don't think that's important. So we could important. just add that word. I'm not create saying. and approve. We can do that, create right? Create and approve is um, create and approve. Approve, approve the approve. school committee budget. Yeah, it, and it's technically our budget too, right? Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I missed that fourth paragraph when I was going through this. So thank you for that, Linda. Goals, I think. So there, it's goals is probably somewhere hidden in that second paragraph with regards to hire, evaluate, supervise, and review. But it needs to be, it's not just the district improvement plan we're reviewing. We're helping to establish, set, monitor, and ultimately we evaluate against the goals. The superintendent is appointed and evaluated by the school committee. Against what? Right? Oh, it, I mean, you so, can add. Yeah, go, uh, technicality by law is actually setting goals. That yeah. is what we do. That, it says our job. That is our job. That's one of our jobs. Maybe I'm, I'm you know me, I'm sometimes a little bit pedantic, but. No, I think they're, they're great <laughs> s suggestions. Can I? Even keeping. I got two out of the three. <laughs> you yeah. just said hire, evaluate, and supervise the superintendent as well as review the district improvement plan and then you said you set and monitor. set and set goals set district mm. goals I didn't get it the answer was check I don't know that I had technical language for it Jean actually okay. as I was going through it it was more brainstorming um, our last meeting when we were doing our protocol there's more in there about collaborating to create the goals and things like that mm. I think maybe we can go back and look at that language and steal it for lack of a better way um, see how we can fit it in here 
um, because I think we went through a very good process of coming to that language where it was a collaborative process. It is a collaborative process of creating goals. Um, it's not just that we want something, he has to agree, it's something that he can achieve, all that kind of fun stuff. The word SMART and all that, the acronym SMART coming in, somehow, some way, if we can weave that in there. I'm just looking at this and wondering if it would um, suffice to say um, there are two places where that collaborating over goals might fit. So uh, in the second paragraph, hire, evaluate, and supervise the superintendent as well as review district improvement plans and collaborate to set goals. That might be one place. Um, I don't know if we're going to get word for word from our protocol because that's a larger document and it needs to fit. There's one particular sentence in the protocol about collab about the goal process. I mean, does it say smart? It, I can't. And it does say smart. It does say collaborate. So, so I mean, I can probably pull it up. In fact, I know I can. So hold on a second. The second place that I was as thinking. Well, as review the district improvement plan and collaborate in the establishment of smart goals. That would work. We're not going to vote on this tonight. I want to see the. Yeah. Okay. So I wonder, given that, then I or Linda or anyone can take these can take these suggestions. I did take notes on what needs to happen, so I'm happy to take them and make those. I I made the note about looking to the protocol for the one sentence. Um, these are a lot of amendments that I. Yeah, and yeah, we'd like, need I'd to like, see it. I'd like to look at it again. Absolutely. It's going to need some formatting, editing to get fit in there. So, so, the, so just so you know, the words from the protocol is clearly defining aspirational and smart goals for the district in collaboration with the superintendent. So that one sentence, okay. Which is a very long sentence, having worked with this um, <laughs> Linda, did, formatting. Did you do this or did, no? <laughs> it was from 2006 or so the where, original where is one. the electronic version of this? I have an electronic version of it. I, I have um, the I have the latest version. Okay. I have the latest edited version, which I can send to whoever is. So Go. I have Go. a request. Um, this has been in the making since 2014. Mm -hmm. So I think that it would be really good if we treated it as we do our policies, where we have a first read, that's what this would be, and then a second read where we might we can see the red line version of it so that then we can feel confident voting on it so that it doesn't get pushed out another. No, it's not going to yeah. get pushed out. What I was going to say is uh, we have the electronic version. If we, if you have any, if anybody has any changes that, or anything that about that, just send it to me and I'll make sure that that, that gets incorporated into the Version, hopefully red line version that we'd be able to vote on at our next meeting. One point of order on that yes. is that, and maybe not the right words, but this being a very brochure-y thing, if you red line it, there's no way it's going to look like a brochure. Not right. right. Just, <laughs> so just, not might red need, line it, just different color text. You might need something different else color text, to not red technicalities line. again, but yeah. I, I foresee a challenge also if we all send you different things. I'm not, it's going to be very difficult to decide how to incorporate the different. That's so let me, what we can get I ask, paid for, right? Yeah, <laughs> the big bucks. May I ask a procedural question? Yes. Um, while I appreciate that this is here at the meeting and that we are talking about it, is it technical enough and open enough that it requires it doesn't, I mean, technically it doesn't require a vote, really. It's not a policy issue, right? right? It does, I mean, it's nice that we're discussing it, but I don't even think it would fall under open meeting law necessarily. It's not business before the school meeting, the school committee, technically. It's not, we're not voting on anything from a policy or budget or anything else along those lines. We're not looking at anything from a, you know, it's not, doesn't really substantively change our no. mode of operation, is it necessary? I know it's appreciative from a public perspective, but is it necessary? It falls under the same uh, 
situation as the protocols. We don't have to vote on those either. It was just something we did to just to memorialize it uh, officially. So, no, we don't have to vote on it, but uh, I don't even, uh, I mean, I didn't. The, re the reason? Yeah, so I think just we got a request to vote on it. But. The reason why I was asking that just yeah. before you jump in, apologies, is because we could probably establish just a shared document in this case without violating open meeting law and editing mm -hmm. it. I don't know. I mean, and maybe Colby can answer that question relatively quickly. No? Anytime you collaborate outside of the meeting. Right. I, I'd like to suggest that it's, we are mandated if someone is going to speak for us to vote on what they're going to say, and this document speaks for us. So I feel as though Yes, for the perception, we should vote on it, but more so that we're putting this out there as something that represents us. And so I feel like we should all vote on it so that we are, we all own it. And, and nobody was suggesting that I think that we wouldn't vote on it. I think it was a point asking clarification oh, okay. as to whether we should, whether we have to vote on okay. it. Well, really, it was more of, is there a better way for us to edit yeah. it without worrying about you know, back and forth and, and coming again and, you know, is there a more productive way we can do it? I have a productive way. We give it to the English teacher. <laughs> <laughs> she gets a D tonight. <laughs> did, um, yeah. Okay, quick. So I did make a lot of notes about all of that feedback, so I do feel like I have a good sense of this. So. I guess my kind of question to the committee is, do you think you're gonna go home, think about this, and have a bunch more, or do you feel like this was kind of the robust discussion, and if I capture all of this, it's probably gonna be okay? I think if you capture it, I'm good. Okay. Yeah. So, maybe that's the easiest. I'll go mock it up, or Linda can, or we'll figure out who does it, and then we'll put it in the next packet for a vote. And I'm sorry I volunteered you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you want the last motion on the vacancy? Yeah, so as I mentioned at the uh, outset uh, regarding Ms. Webb's uh, resignation, uh, we, the, it's been out there, the, the resignation went to the town clerk, so the Board of Selectmen has seen it, but by, uh, they're aware of it, but I'm still required uh, by law to notify them of, of the vacancy and recommend a, a process for uh, re appointing someone. So uh, we're still trying to nail down a date. Yeah. Uh, and we were, I was trying to tie it to one of our meetings, but it doesn't look like that's going to work. That's the 17th. The 17th won't work for, there, the, for some members of the select but there, there is a financial forum on the 16th, so Could do we're going to go back. Earlier, yeah, yeah. we're going to look, we're gonna see, look if to we, see if that's feasible. See if that's feasible with the Board of Selectmen to do it that night before the financial forum. Yeah. So uh, that's, that, yes. That's going to be a long night, that financial forum. It might be starting it at 6. Um, they mentioned in the last finance committee meeting they have a lot to cover in that night, and it could very well be a very long night. Mm. Now, the finance committee may be seeing something they need to see before that at 6, and then it becomes the open portion at 7 or something, and maybe us and the select board could do something at the six at 6, but that sh could be tricky to navigate. Well, we can, uh, we'll uh, get the town manager's read on that, yeah. uh, and if he, he'll, he'll certainly say if he thinks it's too crowded to do that. And then we just pick another night. No, we'd have to go, we'd have to go later at this point, because yeah. it's at least a 14-day posting. Yeah. It has to occur. Oh, so we're not in time to do the 16th? No, no, you are right now. We are, but uh, further than that. But you, you can't, if it's not the 16th, you'd have to push it out. It can't be before the 16th. Okay. I have, a qu I have in my calendar that the financial forum starts at 7.30. Is that not that's correct? That's the typical time the finance committee meets. That's oh, why. that's why. 
So, but now it's at seven? Well, it, they were debating how early it was going to be at the end of the last meeting, and it could be as early as six. They may have to, they were trying to see if they could fit something in another meeting before that, so they didn't have to have it so long, but they're trying to figure it out. I don't know that, I haven't seen it finalized, so. Yeah. It well, I was like gonna loop back to the town manager tomorrow <clears throat> with, uh, with this possibility, and then he can give us guidance if that yeah, works. Yeah, he, he, he'll tell us whether it doesn't make sense to do it that night and, uh, you know, more to come on that. Uh, we do have to, we have have a motion that you have to allow me to, to notify the Board of Selection. Um, move to authorize the Chair to notify the Select Board Chair of the School Committee vacancy and ask that the position be posted. Second. All those in favor? Five zero. Okay. I guess we're to reports. Uh, is there any, uh, Nothing for me. Doctor, doctor. Rakasa held a fabulous annual meeting yesterday, um, and at that meeting, we were introduced to Sammy Salkin, who is the new. Um, outreach coordinator she came before she was supposed to even start and was um, she just glowed I really think she's gonna be a wonderful asset she's very excited about getting into the schools and working with the students and carrying the message um, that we just saw is so important um, it was a real mix of people I'm not sure how many ended up coming but 150 easily that's a guess 180, thank you. Um, people at the meeting and Chris Heron's film refocused us like we've been, see we've been doing in Reading on the first day. So no longer just focusing on, not that we've been focusing on only the response, but emphasizing that we need to think about how these things start. When do kids start relying on drugs and what's going on in their lives? And he did a really good job, I think, of emphasizing that both those kids that don't do it and those kids that do do it need our support um, and interventions. And I mentioned before about the role modeling, um, how important it is to um, collaborate with kids so that they understand the impact of their actions on those younger than them. Um, and we're in the process at, of RACASA of recruiting more people and figuring out who are gonna play the roles there um, and we talked about um, the interface again and um, it was great to have the SROs the school resource officers there who suggested picked questions that were discussed and there was a lot of back and forth from people of different ages um, in in considering the questions that were raised about addiction, about how it starts, about how to intervene if you're a parent and you learn about somebody else's child and how you work with your relationships with your own children if you need to alert someone. Um, and I really recommend, I'm, I'm thrilled that this is gonna be offered to the high school who unfortunately had the conflict and there's consideration of doing it with the middle schools, that's being worked on, um, but I highly recommend that the high school parents and their kids attend the program that will be held. Do we have a date for that? March 18th. March 18th, great. And that will, we'll, um, may I address this question? I didn't get the answer to it. Um, will middle school families be welcome to attend that as well? So for the March 18th, we'll be hosting a screening for um, parents and they're welcome to bring um, their children if they wish. Um, we recommend 12 and older. Um, so middle school parents would be more than welcome. And we'll be working with the high school to show the film to students um, during the day so that more students can have access to the film. In working with the middle schools, we plan to just start with sharing the film with staff and allow them to reflect on the film because there's some um, very serious themes in the film. Um, we don't yet have plans to show the film to middle school students, um, but that may um, be something that the, the school administrators discuss. But for now, um, it'll be used as a tool to start more conversation. Thank you very much. It was a very powerful tool. Um, and there were actually athletic teams there 
who came together to watch, which was, I think, very powerful as well. So I think that's, that's all for now. Just a quick one. Um, I wanted to remind the committee that the next CPAC meeting is Tuesday, October 15th at 7 p.m. And I think we're having elections. Yeah. Still wise. Okay. Um, so select board on Tuesday. Um, Anne mentioned, um, Anne Landry mentioned that HRAC is, I forget which, which HRAC it is now. So, <laughs> but one of the HRACs, whichever Elaine was on, is now, ad hoc, ad hoc um, is now. She's on both. She's on both. Well, this one's down to four members. That's and it's a body of okay. seven, so they can't, they have a very hard time getting quorum. So there was a conversation about what they could do. It's, it's based on their policy, so it's not a, a bylaw issue. So they might be adjusting the, the number in that committee down to five or something like that and or finding other people to appoint into that position. So if anybody was interested either from this board or anywhere else to be a member of that committee, you might want to reach out into the select board or town manager or whoever else is, is responsible in that space. Can I, can I just say that's the Human Relations Advisory Committee. I'm sorry to interrupt. Nope, that's, that's not I, the ad hoc. You. That's the it's the regular HRAC, the regular human, human Relations Advisory Committee. Okay, the other thing, um, there are two other things that came out of that. There was, they were there for a long time, I think 11.30 again. But I, <laughs> before I left, the arts, there's going to be an arts festival in Town Common on October 5th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., uh, weather permitting. Um, so artsreading.org is the organization that's putting it on, and it's a lot of organizations around town that are involved in the arts, including Jam for Jake's and, or Jam for Jake and things like that. Um, so if anybody's interested, they said the rain date's the October 6th. Um, so this is their second year trying to do it. Last year they got rained out halfway through, but they're looking to build on it. Um, I point that out because the other thing that was interesting about the select board meeting was the presentation around new crossing road redevelopment. Mm -hmm. um, which uh, they they then started calling Eastern Gateway, and then at the end they started calling it the Yard. Um, but if anybody has a chance to get access to the presentation for that, it was actually it was really quite fascinating, and it centered on making RMLD itself, the building, the core building, an arts center, and with you know grass in front of it, grass behind it, you know streets back behind it as well, leading into it and a few other things. It was really just quite interesting how little things like grass RML. and trees can change everything. RMLD or DPW? RMLD. Yeah. RMLD, yeah. They're, not, they're on Ash Street, right? Yes, yes. So this was Ash Street going, oh, the yeah. there was a triangle of Ash Street going back towards DPW yeah. um, on this side of the tracks, right, that they were looking at as part of the redevelopment and putting a connection through and a street and they showed all the different visualizations of how the existing buildings that were there could could continue to be used. So it wasn't a bulldoze and redevelop, like big plan. It was a incremental change, make this into a livable space, uh, you know, community gathering space, which I thought was really fascinating. Um, so that was that. Um, and then today, as a parent at um, Parker, I was able to participate in watching the angst video. Uh, which some of our community might be at, which is why we have only three people here today. Um, but uh, that, I think, was quite interesting. Um, you know, that was It's focused on anxiety in youth and teens, um, and they were showing it to the entire middle school. Uh, and it started with a lot of the, you know, what does that feel like and how do I do it? And then it, it turned into how do I cope and how do I get, my, get myself out of my head? Um, so, you know, that was kind of hit, hit a little close to home, but it was nice to see and understand and, and whatnot. So I, it's good to see the action of the social emotional learning in, in progress. So. Thank you. So we'll start down the again. So I um, have been very much enjoying getting out, getting into the buildings, meeting with families and community members. Um, in continuing to get to know Reading, and as part of that, we actually got some good news from the state. Um, as part of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, back in 2016, they 
try to put more um, teeth into making sure that states are really looking at disproportionality in terms of students with disabilities. So they check to make sure that we are not over identifying students in terms of special ed identification, placement, or discipline, and by race and, race and ethnicity. And so the state really needed to change how they were looking at the data and collecting it and reporting back to communities around is there a disproportionate number of students that are either being identified or disciplined um, based on their race and ethnicity within special education. And we were notified from the state that there is no disproportionality in Reading, which really shows that the special education process and what teams are doing to ensure that students um, who need support are getting it is in line um, with the state data, which is wonderful news for Reading. Thank you. Great, I have one quick update. We will be giving more information at the financial forum, but we did wanna let the committee members know that the town has closed its books for the prior Fiscal year, we're currently undergoing the annual audit. We're completing our end of year report, um, which we will be filing next week with the Department of Education. But we did want to let the committee members know that we did close out the year with a surplus of just over 300,000, and that's in line with what we had been reporting throughout the year. Um, the last memo that we did um, on May 30th was very close to that some of the change comes in where we had anticipated some additional professional development or work being done by teachers and some of the numbers came in slightly less than what we had anticipated the it is about a 0.6 percent of the total budget so it is still a relatively small number and just as a reminder that's actually spread across all five of the cost centers so when you're looking at the number of individual lines and cost centers that we have. The other piece that we were able to do working very closely with Sharon Stewart is we were able to prepay approximately $475,000 of tuition, which to us was very helpful, especially knowing that we were going into this year um, with a little bit of uncertainty around that number. Um, no guarantees that we can continue to prepay that number, but we did want to take advantage of that. Um, we also were able to purchase a lot of the technology. We replaced a lot of smart boards, a lot of computers. So we did stay in tune with everything we had said as part of the override. And again, a lot of this surplus was related to some of the open positions and timing of when we hired individuals throughout the year. So there'll be more to come in the financial forum, but we did want to give the committee information ahead of that okay, and thank you. the only other item we did want to let folks know because I know we have received questions is we I want to change myself we have hired a new school nutrition director um, we're very excited Danielle Collins will become will be joining us on October 15th the Wednesday after the long weekend she spent many years in Chelmsford and then most recently in Methuen so we will plan to have her come to a future school committee meeting but she we're all very excited. She stopped by a few times already to meet the staff and meet people, and it is continuing the relationship with Wakefield as well. So we're very excited to have her joining us. Great, thank you. Ms. Kelly. Uh, yeah, a couple things. Um, thank you, Mr. Wise. I was gonna mention the angst film as well, um, shown today and uh, tonight and tomorrow at Coolidge. Um, that was actually an idea brought by our behavior coach. Um, so uh, she had been at a workshop and saw it and thought how powerful it was and uh, the middle school principals previewed it and felt it was appropriate. So I think that was exciting. I think the power then from that film goes to how it's used in advisory and in homerooms and discussions with middle schoolers about how can they manage their stress levels. Um, in addition, our <coughs> behavior coach today um, did her first training for Open Circle, uh, which is the social emotional uh, program that we use here in Reading at the elementary level. Um, if you know anything about it, it's excellent. Um, and up until 
fairly recently you had to send everyone to the uh, Wellesley Center for training. They um, have loosened that up a little bit and she has become a licensed trainer. Um, so today was her first training um, in Reading. So that's a huge um, impact for us. It really means that every new teacher, a lot of times when you roll out programs like that, you train an initial crew and then it's hard to keep up with it. So um, today she trained about 18 people um, and I think all of them had been hired in the last couple of years. Um, so that was kind of exciting. It's a, it's a two day training. So um, we're excited about that and um, kudos to Lauren Sabella for doing those great things and, and thank you to this board and um, I know the, the overall town budget for making that position a uh, community priority because it really does make a huge impact. Uh, the more tools we can give staff to work with students, I think it just, I mean that risk survey, we, we're just gonna see better, better scores in a couple of years, right? <laughs> Continue. Um, the other thing is, as you know, the MCAS um, data w was released this week, um, Monday night at midnight, um, so, uh, we did send out a release of um, really just kind of nuts and bolts what our scores look like. I will be doing a much more comprehensive presentation October 17th for this panel. Um, but just so you know, uh, we have had the preliminary scores for a while. Our data coach has been making the rounds and having one-to-ones with all the principals to really unpack the da data, look at kind of the strengths, look at the things that could be strengthened. Um, some of the schools have started to do that. Um, during PD days, I know um, the middle schools had some time this week to start unpacking um, the scores in, in real deep dives. A um, co couple of things just before October 17th of note. Um, one of the things that came up last year that everyone in Reading was kind of scratching their head was this new category of advanced coursework and we got zero points for that and that were that was um, attributed to the percent of, of high school students, 11th and 12th graders, that take a certain courses, most of them are APs, but some higher level math. Um, and we were sort of like, wow, our, we didn't think our numbers were that low and we didn't get any points. Um, we went to four points, which was the maximum this year. I had thought that it was a statistical situation where our class sizes changed a little bit, so our percentages looked less because there were less students, which is, I think, what happened. So. Um, what was it, the class of 2017 was one of the largest classes we had? Yeah, and then we had so, a smaller <clears> class right after that. So I, I think it was kind of an overcorrection uh, of that. So that was kind of exciting for us because um, we knew that we felt we had a, lot, a large number of kids taking upper level courses. Um, our growth points are up quite a bit. Our scores are relatively similar to last year. Uh, the state has defined a little bit more with accountability. Um, last year they just had an overall like, um, let me see if I can find it quickly, meeting targets, partially meeting targets, and everyone was sort of in that category. This year they divided that up to meeting and exceeding, substantial, moderate, and limited. Um, which I think gives us a better gauge of where you are in that huge band. Um, so we're pretty excited. I think overall our scores are starting to improve. There's certainly some um, trends now that we have to look at, at, at specific grades and at specific schools. I think uh, the work with the data coach over the last number of years has really gotten us used to the language of looking at data. Um, one thing that I just want to point out is that you know, looking at MCAS data really could be a complete full-time 40-hour week job. Um, as a school district, we use it as a guiding principle. We are certainly doing our due diligence. Um, this district spends much more time looking at MCAS data than some of the districts I've worked in, um, but it's not everything we do. So when we, ha when we come on October, when I come on October 17th with the PowerPoint, I just want you to be aware that we are really using the data. A lot of the data we use is really at the classroom level. Um, looking at particular questions that, you know, like every fourth grader in Reading got this question wrong or things like that. Mm -hmm. um, those pieces actually tell us a lot more than just statistical numbers. Um, and we're looking at where our curriculum fits. As you know, we publish pacing guides uh, for our staff this year. Um, so we're, we're really trying to button up a lot of those internal uh, teacher structures so that one of the things that with any test at the end of the year, it's like, oh, well, we didn't get to that chapter <laughs> and there were four questions on it, right? So we don't know where, there's always an end of the year unit, right? And we never know what questions are gonna be tweaked. Some years, like I know one year, like fifth grade had 12 fraction questions, another year they had two. So, you know, it really is, um, 
a lot of it has to do with that. Overall, our scores are quite good, um, substantially prog making progress in all areas, which is one of the higher categories for Reading. So kudos, I know some schools had tremendous growth, and that's exciting. I know um, this community in particular were, was really concerned about Joshua Eaton uh, a number of years ago, and they're continuing, continuing to make extraordinary success. So kudos to that team, and uh, Mrs. DiPolito uh, and her crew have done an amazing job. But we have strong scores really throughout, and the schools that we really are gonna target for extra support, we're looking at that too, so. Excellent, thank you. I wanted to take, take a few minutes to talk about um, the Student Opportunity Act, which is a bill right now that's being reviewed by, uh, I think, first the Senate and the House. Um, it has a lot of support in both branches, and um, it's something that actually emerged from the 2015 Foundation Budget Review Commission, and uh, it's now at a point where all of the recommendations from that commission are coming to fruition in this um, in this bill. So this is something that's on the fast track and probably will be, I would assume, will be passed before the end of the year or will be tweaked and passed before the end of the year. Um, it really does have that much, much support. It's based uh, on increasing funding over a seven year period, over the next seven years. Um, there are some highlights to the bill. Um, I'll do it from a Reading perspective. Uh, the, the, the act itself is meant to help school districts that serve high percentages of low-income students. So um, the communities that have a high percentage of low-income students, which Reading is not in that category, are the ones that are going to receive the largest increase of Chapter 70 funding. However, um, every community is going to benefit. There will always be um, what's called a... Uh, hold harmless amount that's going to be increased in the per, per pupil allocation, which we currently <coughs> receive. Um, I believe that's going to be $30 a student is what they're saying. Um, but where we're probably going to see some benefit are in the areas of special education. So th the bill also provides full funding, which is 75% reimbursement of um, circuit breaker. Um, and and that, that's going to happen starting in FY. Uh, 21. It also is going to, and this is new, it is out, it's also going to start reimbursing for special ed transportation because that currently is not happening with Circuit Breaker. It will be over a four year period. So in FY21, it will be a 25% reimbursement. And then in uh, 22, it's 50%, 23, 75%, and then in 24, 100%. So that for Reading will be a big a big piece of the additional funding that we're going to receive. So that that is significant because, um, as you know, uh, transportation is a, is a big part of the special mm -hmm. edu education budget. We also may see some increases. Um, we will see some increase in foundation rate for guidance and psychological services that support social emotional learning supports. Um, the other thing um, that maybe down the road will benefit Reading is they are lifting the annual cap on MSBA spending. Um, for school building construction, and it's going to be uh, increasing by $150 million a year. Wow. So, um, you know, you have to still qualify, um, but by raising the cap, it give, makes you a greater chance of being eligible. Um, there are some things uh, that obviously we will need to report out on as part of our annual uh, reporting out to the Department of Education. Uh, and really what it is is what we currently do with our district improvement plan. So it says school districts must develop and make publicly available plans for closing opportunity gaps. Ironically, our last three-year district improvement plan, that's what we focused on. Um, so there would be specific goals and metrics to track success. So it would look very similar to what we have been doing with our district improvement plan in previous years. Um, they are also going to establish a 21st century um, education trust fund that's going to, it, it seems like it's an innovation fund. We don't know a lot of details of what this looks like yet, but it's um, to pursue creative approaches to student learning and district improvement. So those are the highlights. We, I, I have left a lot of information in, um, at your chairs for you to review, <coughs> uh, including the actual bill. Um, as soon as we, and we have shared this also with the town manager, 
um, as well. There is a round table next Wednesday that Senator Lewis is holding. Um, Did you move it? Uh, I'm sorry? Do they move it again? No, next Wednesday. October 2nd. Next Wednesday. Oh, that's a Wednesday. Yeah, next Wednesday. Uh, at Stone and Middle School. Um, so that will be interesting to hear. What time's that? Because he's, he's uh, the, the joint chair of the Education Committee. He's, he's one of the chairs. Uh, it's at 7. Of the yes. Can we notify for that? Just in case. We got emails on it. Oh, but oh, can we notify we that we're attending in case we have a quorum? Post. Oh. You mean post? post. Yeah. yeah. Post. Thank yeah. you. Sorry. We can do that. Um, and as soon as I get more information or our associations get more information, we'll be more than happy to share it. I, I, John, I just a question. I think you touched on it, but with all of this extra potential money, I'm just thinking in like the spe the the transportation. I mean, how is that going to bring a lot more burden on our reporting to get that money? Uh, <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. Great question. I'm going to go with yes. <laughs> I mean, we, the, sometimes you spend more money to get the money. It's uh, the, the circuit breaker process is in and of itself yes. is incredibly labor intensive with incredibly short time frames. We do now, we started the year before last year where we actually apply for the extraordinary relief, which basically we have to accelerate all of our filings, but then it makes the end of year filing a little bit easier. So we're continuing with that process. This will be another added step. And I will say from the Medicaid reimbursement that we also submit for quarterly in this, they, they, it is becoming progressively more difficult to do the filings gather the information and meet mm. some of the thresholds. Yeah. So, uh, so, but TBD. we will continue to pursue all avenues that still we can. It's still worth it, but it's a lot of work. The circuit breaker is definitely yeah. still worth yeah. it. Is the timing of that in the school year, is that in the spring, mm -hmm. the application the spring. for, for the, that, when you have all this time intensive pressure, is the, that in the spring when you're the, the circuit breaker <laughs> extraordinary relief is early spring and then believe it or not the final filing for the year is typically due so the year closes on june 30th the filing is typically due july 2nd or july 3rd so we've started Happy to holidays. already <laughs> we, we're trying to start to build the files yeah to, now yeah we so go. we're trying to change some of our processes so that as as the um, students' IEPs are reviewed that may be eligible for circuit breaker. We can do it on more of a rolling basis so that it's not um, all overwhelming at the end. So, so it's still a lot, and it is. It, yeah, it's not the most automated process by any stretch of the imagination. Sounds like an opportunity. Yes. Unfortunately, it's at the state level, not. Yeah. Not this one is actually, I think, for Ms. Kelly. Um, if parents in the community are wondering when they are going to receive oh, their I'm sorry, I individual have said that. Yeah. child MCAT scores. So they are house. mailing them to us next week. Okay. Uh, and we say this every year because people are like, oh, you know, when are we getting them? We stuff them as soon as we get them. It does take a while. There are a lot of them. So it, it usually takes us a little over a week to get them ready to go out. That, again, it, it's, it's labor intensive. So... Um, that's what we're going to do, and, and we'll get them out as soon as we can. Thank you. They don't sit around long. Mm -hmm. That's all I got. Thank that's you. It. Anything else? Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention, uh, a committee, one of the committee members mentioned to me that maybe we set up a policy subcommittee because we, you know, we've been looking a lot, and there's a lot of things we've been talking about to, to update and change so I'm gonna put that on the probably put that on the uh, take a look at what the next agenda looks like but potentially put a discussion on that because I think it sounds like a good idea Maybe to, uh, yeah. would that subcommittee look through the oh I guess that's what we'll discuss is what the role would be <laughs> yeah rewind I just want to have Sorry. a discussion <laughs> thank you <laughs> Anything else? A couple of yes. things um, for future agendas or for the next one for old business, I guess, as the case may be. 
Um, we talked back in July about our CASA and the letter for FERPA and all that kind of fun stuff and making sure that was executed. Um, I know that's been in process, but just to follow up on that. We talked in July as well about the RMHS handbook and the updates that might be happening to that, so scheduling those updates appropriately going forward, um, which obviously includes, she's not here to speak for herself necessarily, but scheduling school council related updates for RMHS itself. Um, there's a school council meeting on October 1st and it's not on that agenda yet, probably because she has to do the school improvement plan first. Um, but that's one of the things we talked about, so I just wanted to follow up on that and see if we can get that on the calendar as part of our follow-ups. Um, somewhat aligned to that would be getting the actual school improvement plans on the calendar for review. Um, as state law says, we're supposed to have some sort of input to it. Um, and then also, since we probably are going to start going through the process, and I've seen the requests come in for uh, kindergarten signups, we might want to talk about a kindergarten placement policy adjustment okay. or policy creation or something else along those lines so that we don't have challenges for a third year in a row, if at all possible. It's so easier said than done. the difficult part of that are the letters are ready to go out. For signups, not for placements. No, but in there it, it describes how we do it. How we do it. And I actually just looked into this um, the other day and I actually asked Mrs. Borowski and there is nothing in the minutes that said that the school committee wanted us to change the policy for this year. That's true because I 100% agree with that. So, um, no, there, for, for there, next year. I'm talking technically about. there is no policy. So we could no, there, there, is, there is. There is a there policy. Is. There's a guideline. There's not a policy, right? That was part of the conversation back in February is there's guidelines. You have these three or four placement guidelines, but there is not a policy as it stands right now around there's that. An there's a, there is a, a policy that we've been following. Is okay. that the attendance? Front? Yeah. There's, there, yeah, there, oh, okay. I guess, I guess I'm differentiating between the four or five I'm going to go to my local school. I'm going to go to yes. right. That's a that's a guideline versus that's not written in any policy anywhere. Correct. Right. Correct. That's what I'm referring to. But that right, right. But that's the feedback I received in I can't remember now if it was February. I think it was February eighth. Mm -hmm. um, was that we were going to continue with those guidelines for this upcoming year? And the reason why I'm saying that is because the letters are ready to go out. And we would not be able to wait for two more meetings because the, the kindergarten meeting is November 6th. Okay. I, I don't have an objection to the guidelines as they're written. I just wanted to make sure that we <coughs> had that conversation appropriately. And maybe, maybe next week, I mean, they're going out already, so we can't, you know, don't stop the bus, right? But we should just maybe review it on October 16th real quick and just say, Yep, these are still what they are. It is what it is, right, for the time being, and then have the conversation about whatever else we want to do. Um, so that next time he comes to this, he doesn't have these problems of are we going to do something or are we not going to do something. Um, and maybe I'm just I'm just one, so there's four other opinions here, so. Yes. I'm a little bit concerned about doing it next meeting because if the letters are going out that articulate here's our process and here's what happens, and then we as a committee a week later or the week earlier are having a discussion about possibly some future changes, I think it's apparent that sends kind of mixed messages. So I don't know that next, I don't know that this month is the right time. If we wanted to make changes, it wouldn't be for next year because the letters don't stop the bus, as you said. We'd want to make it for the following year and I think maybe that time frame would be more like, I could have to think about it. March. March, right. I'm a little bit nervous about just creating confusion in the community about they're talking, they're talking about guidelines, but I just got a letter and it could be confusing. 20, so I would actually propose putting it off a little bit. For 2021. Ultimately, you guys control the calendar, just ideas to put on the calendar, right? Yep. Anything else? Just to follow up on the brochure. That's already on there, right? Yeah. yeah. That will be under old business. <laughs> Very old business. <laughs> <laughs> Would you move to adjourn? Is there, there something? Oh. Is there John a second? Like you wanted Sorry, to yeah. Oh. Yes, John. At, at some point in the near future, I'd also like to get an update on athletic start times. 
uh, as far as practice times, as to the commitments that were made and made with Mr. Zaya saying that practices would be done by six versus what's going on in today's actual with late start and everything else. Okay. So if I can not comment on the answer, but um, in November, Ms. Boynton is coming uh, and um, Ms. Williams to do a high school slash guidance presentation. And I've already asked her to do an update on late start and we can include the athletic piece at that perfect. meeting. That's good. Yep, that's perfect. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Five zero. Thank you.